I believe in slime <laughs> and stink <laughs> and every crawling putrid thing, every possible ugliness and corruption, you son of a bitch. <laughs> I believe that my name is Nathan Simmons. And uh, I think that nothing gets fixed around here. Just a bunch of pies and anchovies. <laughs> and... <laughs> I am a carp in a bathtub, hey. and this is the Silver Linings Exorcism, a oh. ritual that tries to find the silver lining in some of these priests' worst endings. Bravo. Hey, not bad. I'm coming for the Catholics on this episode, y'all. <laughs> C-U-M-M-I-N-G, yeah, or- That's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> <laughs> Kobe. Uh, <laughs> boy. Oh, wow, man. We're starting Spooky Linings off on a rough track, but uh, we're here. Mm. We made it, everyone. Season seven, Spooky Linings kicking off. Mm-hmm. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, just joining us, uh, we are the Spooky Linings playlist, and we like to watch horror movies that don't have the most upbeat or uh, happily ever after ending, mm-hmm. and uh, we like to discuss them and then talk about what our silver linings are at the end of those movies, and today- we are talking about The Exorcist 3, colon, Legion. Movie film for theaters. <laughs> because The Exorcist, the new one, The Believer, was coming out this week. You gotta sing it like the Imagine Dragons song. Oh, yeah. The Exorcist, The Exorcist, Believer. <laughs> and that's it. God damn I don't, it. I'm not familiar with that song. See, I do that, but I do that with uh, Fatal Attraction, where I go, Fatal Attraction, Fatal Attraction, welcome to the movie. V, Glenn Close Boobies. That's what I do. Oh my God. <laughs> I could not figure out what song you were doing. <laughs> I still don't fucking know. I'm not a very good singer, if you uh, haven't noticed. <laughs> I wish it was spooky weather outside. And I do. No. Instead, it's like fucking Satan's asshole out it's there. It's 90 degrees in goddamn September. So fucking hot. I hate it. But what I don't hate is this movie, because uh, contrary to popular belief, The Exorcist has at least one good sequel out of it. Yeah. And it's this one. It's not bad. <clears throat> it ain't half bad. And I guess we can go ahead and discuss it now. I think we all watched the theatrical cut, except for you, Nathan, who watched both. Yeah. So I watched the theatrical cut, and then I watched the quote unquote director's cut that Scream Factory put out. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> what the fuck are you eating? Nothing. <laughs> 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 and uh which is sort of cobbled together from left like the dailies that they were able to find from the original shoot so it's still not totally it's more it's what they think the director's cut would be right yeah it's as close as they can get with what they have available yeah blatty's not still with us is he no i don't believe so yeah i didn't think so but the uh yeah it's it's closer to his original novel he's actually alive and well and is gonna <laughs> listen to this episode and be like i'm fucking not dead i'm right he- <laughs> i'm alive he starts <laughs> screaming in Brad Dourif's voice. He's going to be screaming at us, please kill me now! Shoot me! <laughs> Shoot me now! <laughs> oh, no, he died years ago. 2017. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, R.I.P. William Peter Blatty. <laughs> Look at that stash. I know, it was beautiful, wasn't it? But the, the director's cut is, is a lot closer to the original novel, Legion, and uh, in good and bad ways, mm-hmm. uh, which we, we can discuss as we get into it. Yeah, so The Exorcist 3, my pick. Mm-hmm. I felt like we had covered a lot of the big tentpole uh, horror franchise at this point. We haven't talked about an Exorcist movie. Mm-hmm. And I had just seen this one for the first time last year. And I thought, you know what? I watched this one and I watched the second one back to back. Buddy. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't think I got much to say about Exorcist 2. No. Other than P and U. Those are the two <laughs> letters I would use to describe it. Yeah. But Exorcist 3. I was like, this ain't half a bad movie. This is a pretty good one. Well, I mean, it's a they they literally like, all right, we're going to make a sequel to the one of the most famous horror movies of all time. But mm-hmm. hear, hear me out. What if it's like a whodunit? Yeah. Yeah. It's, what if it's a detective movie <laughs> with uh, almost no on-screen gore? A slow burn. The, yeah. slowest of, the slowest of birds. My God. Hear me out. The Exorcist Noir. Mm-hmm. Basically. Would it surprise you to know that there is a stage adaptation of this movie? Not at all. Not, Not one bit. No, because <laughs> so much of the movie is just two dudes in a room. Yeah, it's just people talking. That's mostly what it is. It's... uh. Did Neil Abute do the stage play for this one? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, The Exorcist 3. Uh, was this anyone's first watch? No. No? I've revisited this movie more than I've revisited the first one. Oh, okay. All right. 
Yeah, it's uh, if you've never seen it, I would definitely recommend you at least check it out once. Mm-hmm. It's different for sure. Like mm-hmm. Mally said, it's definitely less of a horror movie and more of a whodunit. But mm-hmm. there is some spooky bits in this movie and uh, a couple of scamps here and there. Spooky bits. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I would argue the horror elements are the weakest parts of the movie. <laughs> yep. Damn near. Damn near. Yeah. I think Brad Dourif is the MVP of this movie, but mm-hmm. George C. Scott, not far behind. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting movie for sure. And it is it is a sequel, not in name only, like mm-hmm. it, it just is a different thing is, is the best way I describe it. And what's interesting is that it's, it's a sequel to The Exorcist, but it's more of an adaptation of the novel Legion, which was right. a sequel to The Exorcist. So there's... Like in the original film, Kinderman and and uh, Karis interact maybe once. Right, like they barely know each other. But in this movie, it's building off of the original novel where they were best friends. You know, I was gonna say when George C. Scott says he was my best friend, I'm like, I what movie him. were you in? Because I don't remember that at all. <laughs> right. So yeah, the history of this movie is they wanted to make a sequel to The Exorcist, even though Exorcist Two didn't do so well. And William Peter Blatty, who wrote the original, wrote this. He didn't really want to do it at first until he came up with this idea of Legion, and then wrote that novel. Novel. Mm-hmm. Well, first it was a screenplay, and he's like, eh, they don't want to make it, let's make it a novel. And they're like, oh, we do want to make this a movie. And he's like, all right, I'll turn it back into a screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Freakin was going to do it. By the way, we should say RIP to the god, William Freakin, who just passed away this year. Yeah. Was going to do it, had some creative differences with P- with uh, with Peter Blatty and the in the studio. And so, he, do you guys know who was who else was going to direct this movie? John Carpenter. The no. god was going to direct this movie. Yeah. In fact... I, I was uh, reading up about it today. He wrote it about it in his his book that he put out, the the John Carpenter Prince of Darkness book. Mm-hmm. And he said, I met with Blatty over the course of a week, perhaps a week and a half. He had director approval. So he was testing and probing me to find out who I was and how smart I was, <laughs> whether or not I should direct the film. And uh, Carpenter says he was ambivalent about the script, but only because it didn't have an exorcism scene in it, which is ironic mm-hmm. because then the movie did end up having an exorcism scene in it because of the studio wanting to put one in there. <laughs> right. And so Blatty decides to direct it himself and for all its faults in that it's mostly tell don't show i do think it's like you said it's a slow burn that works for me yeah and and i think a lot of that is due to the strength of the performances Mm -hmm. and some of the weirdest fucking dialogue some very like strange monologues and little character moments that that sort of ground us with these people yeah george c scott is uh He's great in this movie, but he is giving a performance. He is making <laughs> some choices. Uh-huh. But again, I kind of dig it. I, it's it's weird. I don't want to say this movie is a mess because it's not, but mm. it feels like it should have been a mess. Well, it's it's weird, right? So he, uh, William Peter Blatty, finally gets the you know the go ahead to direct. Uh, a film based on his novel Legion by Sapphire, by Le- <laughs> <laughs> and so he he moves forward with this. I can't not focus while you're doing I'm that. Sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. I haven't eaten. He moves forward with developing this movie based on Legion. And then the studio is like, well, we want to call it The Exorcist 3. And he's like, mm-hmm. fucking fine, whatever. And they shoot this, you know, quiet, slow burn uh, detective movie uh, where they've recast all of the characters, including... Right. Uh, Brad Dorif is now playing, you know, the body of Father Karras inhabited by the Gemini killer. Right. The studio then demands reshoots to add an exorcism scene. So they have to add in all of these extra scenes with uh, Nicole Williamson as Father Morning, mm-hmm. who comes in like fucking Rambo at the end of this movie. Yeah. The exorcist, last blood. <laughs> And it ends up having, like, this weird disjointed effect where, yeah, the the, th- the last third of this movie is a completely different film. Like, yeah. Oh, no. When Father Morning pops up, my note is just, who the fuck is this guy? Right. Yeah. That's my one big problem with this movie is Father Morning should be more of a character in this movie. Yes. Or he should not be in it at all. Yeah, it's glaringly obvious that he's not part of the story. Yeah. So, if you've never seen The Exorcist 3, let's do a quick deep dive into it, and then we'll uh, we'll watch the trailer, and then we'll discuss the movie. Mm-hmm. Sound like a plan? I like it. All right, let's do it. So, the trailer is an exorcist, right? <laughs> God <laughs> damn it. Uh, the year is the year of my birth, 1990. Mm. The director is William Peter Blatty, as we mentioned, who is also the novelist for the uh, source material here. Mm-hmm. The movie stars George C. Scott. Ed Flanders, ah, so close. Jason Miller, <laughs> Scott Wilson, Nicole Williamson, and of course the God Broad 
Broad. Broad. Brad Dourif. <laughs> so wait, so Jason Miller isn't in the director's? No, he's he not. Is, it's so just Brad Dourif. Depending on who you ask, Brad Dourif says that Jason Miller's alcoholism had it had gotten to the point where he couldn't memorize any of his lines. Right. He had wet brain, as he calls it. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah, he says he had wet brain, which is <laughs> an insane description. Uh-huh. Yeah. I love fucking writing that one down <laughs> and then it's, it's good and then blatty just is like way more diplomatic about it and he's just like ah, uh, he wasn't available yeah so they shoot the movie with brad dorif and then the studio when they demanded the reshoots they were like we'd also like you to reshoot a bunch of scenes with jason miller and so then we end up getting this hybrid performance that moment in the theatrical cut where uh scott like looks at the the file on the gemini killer and it plainly shows a photo of brad dorif mm-hmm. is not in the director's cut because right. it was meant to be like we are looking at father karis's body yeah uh it's a it's a weird choice to like but i i kind of dig it where we go back and forth between what george c scott is seeing and what this spirit is that's inside of him see i i think it works in the theatrical version i, I, do. Dig I do too. jason miller a lot in this movie i do too and i guess we should say this because this is probably a lesser known uh movie from people i mean i'm sure a ton of people have seen the original but maybe haven't dove into this one before mm-hmm. so the quick synopsis is george c scott is playing kinderman from the first movie who was a minor character a police officer mm-hmm. uh who is uh friends with father karis who is of course one of the main uh people of the first movie he's the obviously the one that goes out the window at the end and there is a bunch of murders that keep happening 15 years after the events of that movie ignoring the second one Mm -hmm. and they all bear the same mo that is reflective of a serial killer that was active in the background during the scene of the first movie called the gemini killer and what we end up finding out is (laughs) <laughs> this is i'm trying to explain this succinctly um at the time that uh pazuzu the demon was possessing reagan mm-hmm. in the first movie the gemini killer was getting sentenced to death in the electric chair and when pazuzu jumped into uh father Karras's body and he jumped out the window and died right then is when the gemini killer was was killed in the electric chair <laughs> satan was so angry with how they were able to exercise pazuzu out of reagan that he allowed pazuzu to inherit the now dead body of father karis mm-hmm. with the spirit of the gemini killer i this is it gets a little muddy with the it's implied the plan is we're gonna cause a scandal in the church mm-hmm. whenever we use this priest's body to commit murders right unfortunately father karis was brain dead for several hours right before he was resurrected so it took him 15 years to build up strength right also somehow he then gained the power to uh take over the minds of cat tonic patients and use them to do the killing so it still gets a little muddied (laughs) so pazuzu is able to jump to and from different people which is why he infects older people in this uh Mm -hmm. this mental hospital it's it is very muddy but that's why in the movie brad durf and jason miller are kind of coexisting in the same role to Mm -hmm. play with that that aspect and so essentially george c scott's role in the movie is find out if the gemini killer is actually back and then Is Jason Miller, uh, Father Karras, really still in there in the body of Brad Dourif? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a lot. That's a lot to lay on someone. It's convoluted. Yeah. But the thing that I love about it is that so much of this movie is dialogue Mm -hmm. that it doesn't feel out of place when we just have a shot of Brad Dourif explaining the whole thing to us. Yeah, it's it's mostly a self-reflective piece on religion and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the banality of mankind and things like that. Like, it's very, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, retrospective look kind of Mm -hmm. of that first movie. And the and then the novel is even more so like yeah. it is very much like we're just ruminating on theology yes. and the, the nature of good and evil yeah there's an incredible monologue in the book where kinderman basically talks about how he thinks the big bang was lucifer falling from heaven mm. and and all of creation is just what him trying to put himself back together again I mean, like, that's it's, it's cool. like <laughs> it's a beautiful like the way i'm describing it is not doing it justice i, it, I dig it i dig that it's a great book if anybody uh wants to track it down it's fantastic Fantastic. So the movie had a budget of eleven million dollars, and it only managed to gross thirty nine million dollars worldwide. Mm-hmm. And currently sits at what I think is way too low of a score, a fifty seven percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oof. 
I think this is at least a 70. Yeah. You know, 70% seems fair to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a different kind of movie, like I said. It's not The Exorcist from the original, but right. it is an interesting little... It's almost like an ap- uh, appendix. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, you know, it's just a, a little additional thing there that I, I enjoy. The Selmarillion, if you will. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And, <laughs> fellas, I, I know we thought it was a dead bit, but much like uh, Father Karras in this movie, I'm bringing it back from the dead. Mm-hmm. Once again, I have a drink of the film. Okay. Fuck this bit. <laughs> I made what Father Dyer seems to really enjoy a lot of in this movie, which is the lemon drop. Nice. Because he says he listened to a year of kids' confessions and became a lemon drop junkie. So, I was like, you know what? That sounds delicious. I'm going to make a lemon drop. So, I'm going to enjoy this lemon drop while we watch the trailer for The Exorcist 3. You guys ready? Let's do it. Let's fucking go. Tubula Bells. Truly a great theme song it is 17 years ago oh is that um don la fontaine is that him yeah it sounds like him i think so touched our most profound nameless fears do you dare walk these steps again here's your host jonathan freaks <laughs> nor canst thou kill me satan grows stronger you believe in possession father Hell yeah. <laughs> he has found a haven. Come to take a look. It's nine tenths of the law. He has taken possession. The boy had been crucified. His web widens. I've just never seen anything like this in 20 years. Inside this cell. The killer drove an ingot into each of his eyes and cut off his head. Boy, we gotta talk about Inside Thomas's death. That monologue rules. Mario. <laughs> thought had died 17 years ago almost every scene has a weird button that doesn't work yeah whenever the, it comes to like the spooky stuff a lot of the final act here y'all quit fucking with Korean Jesus <laughs> oh yeah that weird morph effect isn't in the movie yeah a lot of wow. the final act in this trailer. <laughs> and the trailer basically saying, hey, fuck The Exorcist 2. <laughs> this is that real shit. William Peter Blatty had an insane quote where he said, in some ways, I think this movie is scarier than the original. I'm like, no. get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I do think that the novel is a better book than the original Exorcist novel. Oh, but this film is not scarier than The Exorcist. No, not in the slightest. Not at all. All right, boys. I got one question before we really get into this. Have you guys seen, I'm sure you have by this point, but have you seen what William Freakin's thoughts are on the sequels to his movie, The Exorcist? No, I haven't. I feel like you're going to make us watch this regardless. I'm so gonna. It doesn't matter what I answer, so push play. It's a very short video. I will say, William Friedkin is up there with Orson Welles as one <laughs> of the greatest haters of all time. <laughs> it is a delight to watch him tear into people. <laughs> Listener, if you have it already, just go on YouTube and search William Friedkin and, and Nicholas Winding Refn and just <laughs> boy just watch him eviscerate that man Jesus Christ <laughs> it's so good it's so funny he is he is genuine he, he was a rock star director yeah. and didn't give a shit about no. being a rock star director <laughs> like it was the the level I, I just watched Sorcerer for the first time since his passing oh yeah that guy is a fucking genius and <laughs> yeah. I'm mad that I haven't watched more of his movies since, other than The Exorcist. Did you guys do Bug on the show? No, no, we haven't. I feel like that would work for this. I mean, are you are you talking about a Bug's Life or Ants? <laughs> <laughs> ants, of course, directed by William Freak. <laughs> but just if you're not familiar with William Freak and the Man, I feel like this short clip here describing his thoughts on the sequels really sums it up. Okay. Most of these sequels that they've made of the X, all of them are ridiculous. <laughs> what I've seen of them, you know, they, they want to make me vomit as, <laughs> as the little girl vomits in the movie. And I find them vomit instilling, starting with Exorcist 2, going on to 3, 4, 5, wherever they are now. <laughs> I haven't seen them. But to have to put up with this Is crap a fifth one on yet? television if you every count week the would be two versions of the prequel, too much yeah. to bear. Well, I'm glad it, to hear that because uh, yours is by far the best. And uh, I know by far the know. best, the others don't even exist. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> he he contradicts himself 
like five times. He's like, that's I have- how I feel when people ask me what I think of Nathan's other podcast. <laughs> sure, <laughs> the others don't even exist. <laughs> <laughs> what, what were you saying, Nathan? Oh, it's just he he starts by saying uh, they make me sick. Then he's like, I've only seen bits of them, mm-hmm. and then at the end he goes, I've never seen any of them. He, he does that in another great clip where he talks about uh, a screening that he was going to go to for the second one and oh, was told wow. it, he's like I, I was gonna go to the screening of the second one i didn't want to really want to go i saw bits and pieces of it something about somebody flying uh, running around on the back of a bumblebee <laughs> <laughs> and he goes i didn't chose not to go but then one of the heads of the studio uh went and told me this afterwards that during the screening about halfway through Oh, before that, he told his driver, you know, go up the street. This movie's two and a half hours long. Get yourself a coffee or something and just, and, you know, come back when the movie's done. Mm-hmm. But don't just, you know, wait around here. And he said, about halfway through the movie, somebody stood up at the theater and go, the pieces of shit that made this movie are in this room with us. <laughs> <laughs> and then so he goes, someone else in the crowd went, where? And he, the first guy pointed and says, back there. And they all, the studio heads ran out of the theater and their cars weren't there because they told them not to come back until the runtime the movie oh was my over. god it's like that that's like a scene out of ed wood uh, <laughs> i mean that second movie dog shit i feel about it the same way i feel about jaws 2 it is just so boring mm. it is so fucking there is nothing going on in either of those movies how is a movie with killer locusts and a mind melding dream machine mm-hmm. that boring and james earl jones right walking around in that movie too yeah. he's just walking around he's just hanging out man <laughs> i don't know all right, so this movie starts, and we get a, a, a good look at the stairs from the original. And mm-hmm. I gotta ask, at this point, I feel like you're kind of divided into two groups and how I identify you is if, when I say the famous movie stairs, if you think Exorcist or if you think Joker. Because <laughs> I feel like there's a generation now that are growing up thinking the Joker stairs are the more cinematic of the two. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I, the Joker is a movie uh, that I have not revisited, so uh-huh. <laughs> I think I'm squarely in Exorcist territory. Well, that, that's what I mean. Like, you're you're on the Exorcist side. Yeah, yes. we're, we're, all, we're Exorcist household in this, in this part. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I do love the receding fog kicking in mm-hmm. right around the time of the theme song just like that just it's very eerie and then these the, the, these opening credits mm-hmm. are six goddamn minutes long yeah <laughs> it's so long i do love the silent cuts in the church before the doors bust open mm-hmm. there's some like really fun uh like tension building here but mm-hmm. then I, this happens a few times in the movie where there, we put a bloody hat on a hat mm-hmm. and like the eyes of the Jesus dude. statue opening is oh so, my so God. fucking funny. Dude, he wakes up like huh? like <laughs> a high dude waking up from a nap just like, what's going on? Who me? He's so tired. He's like, oh man, what's up, bro? He's, <laughs> He's like, like, y'all, hold up. Y'all got Cheetos? What's yeah, it's exactly. It's so fucking funny. Like it's like half eyelids. Just like, what? It's, uh, it's great. <laughs> and then then we get like like a Vietnam shot. It's just three helicopters in front of a giant sun, <laughs> which is pretty cool. Not gonna lie, but it's just these these opening credits are so long. And then like it's a POV shot tracking someone walking down the street, and it's just I feel like this movie tries too hard to have this kind of uh, imagery. This um. I mean, the heaven scene later on is emblematic of that, but oh, like yeah. just Thomas sitting there on the corner handing a rose to no one. Like, it's just, it's weird. Yeah. Dream- it's kind of dreamy, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's also the first of many long takes. Yes. <laughs> in this movie. The biggest problem I have with this movie, besides all the talkie talkie and not enough of the showy showy, is mm. <laughs> it's not lit very well. The mm-hmm. camera angles are very like, First idea, best idea. Like, there's sure. not a whole lot going on in terms of making this cinematic. No, I agree. It does feel a little made for TV at times. My biggest one is when they find the second victim, the priest in the church. Mm-hmm. It's just a the camera is locked down. <laughs> it's a, a wide shot yeah. of just George C. Scott investigating. And like, it's just I don't know, man. Just do do some more. There is one part of the movie where that is used to exceedingly great effect, and we'll we'll get there. But yeah, I I have a. I have a feeling I know what you're talking about. Did you guys recognize the altar boy in this first I, that's scene? That's my next <laughs> note. I, the way I recognized him was his voice. Uh-huh. I was like, there's no way that's not him. <laughs> it's fucking Kevin Corrigan. Yeah. yeah, man. Oh, man. I, I could not believe it. I, I recognized the voice of me. I was like, there's no fucking way that's Kevin Corrigan. He looks like the kid with the x-ray glasses from Texas, Texas Chainsaw, Chainsaw 2. 2. <laughs> he looks like he's in a George Romero movie, not for nothing. He like, does. He does. God. No, it was great. And I was so mad that he didn't show back up in the in the movie no oh. 
And then this is interrupted by an abrupt flashback in, you know, the original version of John Wick falling down the steps. <laughs> <laughs> we introduced a father dyer who I guess is kind of a Georgie Scott's new friend since Father Karras is dead. Well they they were all they were all friends together, like okay. back in the day. Yeah. It's it's a little more obvious in the director's cut because they show more like photos of them together. But yeah. Got it. And he says, uh, what are you doing tonight? And Father Dyer says, I'm going to the movies. I'm going to go see It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. And he says he's seen it 37 times. And I got to ask That's you. about how many times I've seen it. I was going to ask, what movie do you guys think you've seen at least 37 times? Uh, I mean. Like genuinely, not a joke answer. Like, what do you think you've seen that many times? That's a lot. 37 is a lot. I've, I've seen It's a Wonderful Life at least 30 times. Really? I think so. I've won- I watch it every year at least once. And Jesus then- Christ. Oh, as a, as a tradition. That makes Makes sense. Okay. And then beyond that, probably either Batman 89 or Big Trouble in Little China. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mally, you think you got one? No. No. 365 days this day. <laughs> <laughs> You, by the way, I, I still haven't watched the two sequels of that. I found out I, I'm pretty. I think they. Why re- would you? Because I said I was going to. I think <laughs> they did. recast. I think they recast Balsamo in those movies. No, Do I don't think the main guy. Oh. I think they recast him. Melly, you made us watch that. The least you can do is learn learn <laughs> learn their fucking names. <laughs> <laughs> I oh, man, thirty seven's a lot, but mm. I there are those movies I put on. Isn't that how many dicks the the. Where are we going with this? What are we doing? D- Dante's girlfriend sucks in 37? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, oh man, I, I would probably say, because I, I put movies on all the time just to put them on. Mm. Well, actually, I will have to say, I think I've seen Twister that many times. Oh, so. you know what? That make that makes the answer obvious for me that I think I've probably seen Speed 37 times. That, that yeah, yeah. I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How great is Ed Flanders in this movie, though? Great. Oh, my God. It's so good. And there's a lot of uh, weird uh, anti-Semitism in this movie. Like, played as a joke. B- Bill Kenderman's first lines are fucking insane. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The good thing is, he will. I will say, he does point out other people's racism yeah. because this other cop comes in and he says, uh, hey, by the way, you're a racist. He's, he's, <laughs> he goes, he's, the first thing he's doing is lecturing about Macbeth. Mm-hmm. And then he starts riffing about how racist the other and stupid the other cops are. And then we're introduced to his mother-in-law, who's even more racist. Before we get to that, though, the, yeah. the other racist cop, he goes, you're racist, by the way. And that guy goes, what are you talking about? He goes, on your exam, <laughs> yeah. the question was, what are rabies and what do you do for them? And he said, rabies are Jewish priests and I would do anything I possibly could for them. Jesus. And then the closing button on this scene as he's leaving is, by the way, I'm going to go home and we can talk about some wops. Or something. Well, he says, you you guys go home <laughs> That's to your right. wives and talk about it. Yeah, <laughs> It's truly wild. This movie is fucking hilarious. It's so fucking funny. And apparently that's what drew Scott to the role was he was just like the the dialogue is super offbeat. The right. characters are weird and that's what makes it scary to me is right. that these feel like human beings. <laughs> right. It feels more real. Sure. But yeah, t- to your point, the grandma in this movie, the Holy uh, shit. George C. Scott's mother-in-law that's staying with him mm-hmm. I, unprompted, she just goes, J- the Jews are crazy. Yes. They are. They're all crazy. She and does. Then, and then she's talking about her granddaughter. She goes, Pocahontas with that hair. <laughs> I like, wrote that on, down. Grandma, That's get nuts. it together. <laughs> get it together, Grandpa. <laughs> and so George C. Scott and Father Dyer go to the movies and they see It's a Wonderful Life again. This is a packed rep screening of It's a Wonderful Life. Yes. This shit is sold out. This shit is sold out. And I do I do love the detail though that both of them independently say, like, oh, I'm I'm gonna go cheer up him today. Like mm-hmm. he's gonna be sad today because this is when the anniversary of Karis's death. I right. like that detail. I was gonna say, yeah, we should we should clarify. The reason they go to the movies all the time is because Father Dyer and Father Karis used to go and see this movie all the time. Right. And so Kinderman, George C. Scott stepped in to fill in for uh, Father Karras's, you know, fill in his seat for that. Uh-huh. And then we get this insane story <laughs> where as they're coming out of the movies, uh, Father uh, Dyer and George C. Scott are talking and George C. Scott says, you're standing awfully close to me, Father. Can you tell? I haven't had a bath in three days. And I'm like, first of all, dude, you only have one bathroom in your house? Right. Like It's a two story. Uh-huh. And then he tells this story about, oh, my mother-in-law staying with me and she likes 
carp. Mm-hmm. She likes to make carp for 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 dinner, and she, the, the difference is, uh, she thinks carps carry impurities, and so you have to make them fresh. She had to make them fresh. You have to keep them alive. She goes, Father, there's a carp swimming up and down in my bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it keeps me up at night. I haven't had a bath in three days. I'm like, what is this story? It's bonkers. <laughs> but like Ed Flanders, his performance of someone trying to keep a straight face is so funny. Mm-hmm. Like it, it almost feels off the cuff, even though there's no way that it was. Right. I mean, it. it's ultimately a metaphor for George C. Scott's character. Obviously, mm-hmm. he's swimming back up and down during this this investigation mm-hmm. until he's ultimately ready to be served up to Pazuzu, basically. Right. I mean, I know you got to do that kind of stuff in your storytelling, mm-hmm. but that is an insane one to put in this movie. In a, in a wild conversation to have in the middle of a packed auditorium. Like, and it's funny because it's post-movie, right. so you know other people in the theater are like, this guy smells like shit. <laughs> <laughs> but then we, then we cut to this restaurant uh-huh. where... They're, you know, they're sort of reminiscing about Karis, and right. it's in the director's cut. This is the first time we get the idea that Dyer is ill; he's not eating at all. And mm. then Kinderman does this monologue about. There's a lot of monologue. We're going to say monologue a lot in this episode. Sure, but like, it is mostly a monologue movie. <laughs> his description of this murder is terrifying. Oh yes, right. Of uh, okay, so there is a uh, a boy who is killed down by the docks. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they say he's a 12 year old boy and it's it's kind of uh, important to the story that he is a, a black teenage boy or a 12 year old i guess mm-hmm. <laughs> he says they found this boy dead he had ingots driven through his eyes Ugh. his head severed and in its place they put a cut off statue head of jesus painted black face right. and put in place of his head and it's like jesus and he was crucified on a pair of oars right rowing oars yes and i'm like jesus fucking christ the, the the moment that always gets me he keeps cutting back to ed flanders like shaking and sweating and yes kinderman just uh, like george c scott just staring into the middle distance where he says it was painted up like a menstrual show Ugh. he takes a deep breath and he goes mr bones yes like, that's that like gives me chills oh and then Man, just the whole the first time I saw this movie, I was like, "Oh, that sounds awful." Hope I don't see that shit. Uh, <laughs> we do. <laughs> we sure fucking do. At some point. Um, but man, I just that that's oh, oh, god damn. It's it's a lot. It is. It's heavy. And then we find out later on that he was alive when it happened right because they he's they say um another detective says the boy didn't die from having his head cut off yeah he had been injected with this uh paralyzing agent very similar to something like uh, the you know the closest thing i can think of is something like law-abiding citizen where oh, sure gerard butler does that to his victim is paralyzes you where you can't move you can't say anything but you can still feel everything mm-hmm. <sighs> and i'm just like jesus fucking christ it's he died of asphyxiation yeah like yes. It made his lungs stop moving eventually. Yes. It's, I mean, it's, it's. That's fucked up. Yeah. And the Gemini then tells us that he got really good at cutting the head off so that he could hold it up and let them, like, see right. their bodies before they. Yeah. He says, uh, the human head can still see t- about 20 seconds after a decapitation. So what I would do is I would hold the victim's head up and make them look at their own body. Yeah. And it's like, G- which was the original line that the little kid said in, uh, Jerry Maguire <laughs> instead of the human head weighs eight pounds. He was like, you know, you can hold the severed head off. <laughs> That's a better movie. I, yeah. I will. I will say, for as much talky as this movie is for a horror movie, yeah, stuff like that, mm-hmm. I'm okay with not seeing. Oh, yeah. yeah. I kind of want to see it. Well, you, you, <laughs> you fucking do. So, I, I, there's just a chill yeah. in the way it's de- like, and, and I love the choice to have the waitress come up and interrupt him right at that moment. Like, you guys ready? Or you need more coffee? Or whatever she says. And it's I like, kind of hate the trope of the interrupting waiter, mm-hmm. uh, but I kind of love it in this movie. It <laughs> takes him a second to shake himself self out of yeah. telling the story yeah you're so drawn in because he, he has that way of pulling you into his conversation mm-hmm. and like father die you're hanging on every word and then yeah she breaks that tension he does that a lot like mm-hmm. george c scott will draw you in with not only just his monologues but later on he shouts at a doctor mm-hmm. he just goes well you just shut your mouth yeah and then he has to like recompose himself <laughs> yes and you can tell that he's upset like he he doesn't break often and then when right. he does it's it means something it's not just a shouty performance right and when he does he's like it's holding back tears because like 
by that point his friends are dead mm-hmm. and he's like try- he, he can't make sense of it so this performance i feel like is under appreciated I agree. In, like when we when we talk about you know performances in horror movies it's really good and i i don't know if this is a silly thing but like i i wa- I've watch a lot of like slasher movies and like uh, a lot of mo- like modern horror movies i feel like we're missing movies where like the lead character is an older person yeah like i don't know i don't know how to like th- there's something about the the life that he's lived that you can see on his face experience yeah yeah most of the people in this movie are old mm-hmm. the only young people really are the dead boy that we're talking about and then and his, his granddaughter daughter. who's barely in the movie yeah his yeah. daughter sorry the daughter is barely in the movie right like brad durf is the youngest <laughs> leading role it's true no i totally agree this movie is is mostly older people just yeah. kind of talking and i i don't know you're right i i do appreciate that yeah it's just it's just like the u.s government <laughs> exactly. yeah it's exactly fair point but no i i take your point because like yeah most horror movies nowadays it's like the youngest of youngest people we can get to like mm-hmm. i just i i threw on um that new Sophie Thatcher movie, the Stephen King movie, The Boogeyman, the other oh, yeah. night. Uh-huh. And it's just it's just very modernized. It's mm. modern horror, which is it, everything is driven to through like for the plot. Gotcha. There is no just scene where someone's just pontificating or <laughs> right. you know, building up the the atmosphere of this movie, the tone of this movie. And that's what I really dig about this is it does feel very offbeat mm-hmm. and sort of methodical and mm-hmm. it takes its time. And I mean, the, the, the original movie is like that as well. I, I think w- the scariest, one of the most upsetting scenes in the original Exorcist isn't any of the possession stuff. It's a, a little kid getting a spinal tap, you know? Right. Like it's the stuff like that, that is just like the medical horror of it all. And, and just how awful this is in a grounded sense. Yeah. And at that point, we've spent an hour with Reagan and her mom, yeah. and we don't want to see her hurt. God, I got to rewatch the original now. I meant to before this movie, uh, before this recording. But it's great. It is. I mean, I'm not saying anything new. <laughs> it's fantastic. No, and, and one of the scariest mov- parts of that movie, too, is a fucking deleted scene with the, the crab walk down the stairs. Oh, sure. So... Then we get to the next. The, the, it's the interesting part of this movie is like the first kind of three acts of it are mm-hmm. kind of different murders. Yeah, and it's really just George C. Scott going to the crime scene and you know putting his thoughts together. But we get we cut to this uh, priest uh-huh. in this confessional booth and this uh, quote unquote old woman coming in to confess. And boy, this this voice I mean, maybe it's specific to this. It sounds exactly like Norman's quote unquote mother in Psycho. It's oh, like that's the interesting. Same act. It's which is. Actually, um, fuck, what's his name? Anthony Perkins. Anthony Perkins, which is actually his voice, just manipulated. It sounds exactly like it. So it's meant to sound like the demon from the first film. Well, it's supposed to be the old woman. They show right. an old woman, and then you're supposed to, your, your brain connects, and it's supposed to be the old woman in the confessional, but then you see her later, and you realize it's not. Right. But yeah. But what's what's wild to me, there's two things. One, it's Colleen Dewhurst that voices Pazuzu in this movie. Mm-hmm. She was one of uh, George C. Scott's ex-wives. Right. What? That's right. Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. yes. <laughs> and two, she sounds exactly to me like Matt Gorley as Hey Chowder Giger. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit a little bit yeah uh that's funny that we had two reference points for it that's great i created the xenomorph that is exactly what she sounds like <laughs> oh it's funny but man i just i feel like you got to show one of the murders in this movie because mm. the first three we just see the aftermath and george C. scott kind of just walking up to the crime scene sure. i feel like this would have been a decent one to show something, but I do think that the tension that builds here is really g- great. Though yeah. this actor, uh, as uh, Father Canavan, he like his slow realization that there is a monster next to him yes. is, is played very well. Yes. So they this priest is murdered inside this confessional booth. George C. Scott uh, comes to the crime scene. And this is the shot I was talking about, where it's just a, a medium long shot, kind of wide, and he just slowly and like walks from side. To side. Yeah, it just goes to one side of the corpse, lifts up the sheet, looks at it, goes to the other side, lifts up the sheet, looks at it. Touches the body with his bare hands. Yes. I just I just wish this movie looked a little better. Like yeah. I feel like most of it's almost firing on all cylinders. Almost. Mm-hmm. There's just little things I think just prevent this movie from being great. You know what I mean? I think if we had a John Carpenter boy behind the camera. Boy, man, yeah. Because he could he also could have made those static shots work as well. I was like, gonna say if Dean Cundy shot this, yeah. this movie, whoo, this movie would have really purred. 
Yeah. But I do, we do get some interesting, like, things. Like, the, I like the conversation through the broken confessional screen. Yeah. I think that's really well done. Well, it's great, too, because he's sitting there kind of just, like, George Scott is kind of just taking it all in. Mm-hmm. And then that other, it's almost a jump scare, the other detectives plopping down in the <laughs> right. other side of the confessional and then telling us about the, the poison, the paralyzing agent and, and the boy. Mm-hmm. And then I love that he goes to, um, like 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 the forensics detectives build like a little <laughs> fake confessional thing and <laughs> yeah. he has to explain like oh well the, clearly there would be fingerprints on the other side of the little sliding door and that oh, would I love all this stuff yeah those fingerprints would match up with fingerprints on the body at the docks and then the detectives are like no they don't it's two different killers yeah, yeah. and he's like how was that possible and it's it is a it, like it, like you said Mally it is a slow burn but it's a very engaging slow burn I feel like oh couldn't agree more yeah meanwhile there's a there's a cut scene here that's in the director's cut where he goes to visit Father Dyer in the hospital because he's getting checked out Mm -hmm. and Dyer in an extended version of the scene he asks about Father Conovan and he's like did he die like painfully yeah and Kinderman is just basically like no we figured out he was injected with something so he didn't and he lies to him he's basically like he didn't feel anything yeah which I think is a really like an interesting character moment that I kind of wish was in the theatrical version well speaking of the you know the Father Dyer uh George C. Scott goes to to the, this hospital that Father Dyer's in, yeah. and he's you know there, he brings him this little stuffed penguin that I thought was great. Yeah, Dyer's reading Women's Wear Daily because mm-hmm. he doesn't want to preach in a vacuum. Which is, <laughs> I think really funny. It's just the the, the the chemistry between these two actors are great. Uh, like their their relationship's great. It's fantastic. I love how quickly the scene goes back and forth between like the the rebuttals and everything of like mm-hmm. uh, you're in a hospital and he's like yeah but my brother had these same symptoms. Your brother died at thirty. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. And and I think Father Dyer even quotes Spaceballs. He does. He to says, George C. Scott. No, it's uh, when the nurse comes into the wrong room. He goes, go in peace, my child. May the Schwartz be with you. Yeah, he <laughs> said, you want peace? May the Schwartz be with you. And I love how the nurse comes in, too. She goes, are you guys okay? And George C. Scott goes, we're fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's so curmud. I love a curmudgeon need like d- detective in a movie. Oh, God yeah. damn it, it's so good. So yeah, he's in the hospital. He seems to be okay. So George C. Scott goes home. He falls asleep, <laughs> and this is where we get the wildest <laughs> scene of this movie, I think. Yeah, uh, which has been dubbed the heaven scene, mm-hmm. and it is bonkers, truly baffling. Yes. Yeah, like if you've never seen this movie, just absolutely bonkers. Just you go to YouTube and just type Exorcist Three Heaven Scene and just. Experience it for the first time because pause this episode <laughs> now. Take a minute to yourself. <laughs> if you thought Fabio wasn't in this movie, you were wrong. And just live a little. If you thought Patrick Ewing wasn't in this movie, you were mistaken. Because he plays the angel of death. Wild. <laughs> and Samuel L. Jackson is also Samuel in this. Samuel Jackson scene. with an uncredited Z. Yeah. yeah. Wild. Maybe the funniest lie delivery in this movie. I know what you're about to talk about. I know what you're about to say. <laughs> oh God. So Thomas, the the murdered black boy from the the, the beginning of the movie, mm-hmm. is there with his neck stitched up. His neck has got stitches on it. He has like piercing blue eyes. <laughs> I guess because the ingots were driven in. It would be so fucked if you arrived in purgatory with like whatever injuries killed you what, with a severed neck. Yeah, it's insane. And then <laughs> Fabio is just standing there. He's an angel. They're in basically. It, it looks a lot kind of like um. Uh, Mal, you probably know the actual name for this, but like the the waiting station in uh, Harry Potter, <laughs> right? <laughs> when he quote unquote dies. Oh uh, well, it takes. I mean, technically they don't give it a name, but it's basically implied to be like a heaven version of King's Cross. Yeah. Right. It looks ex- it looks like that, and then there's bit. like there's people playing music, <laughs> the Lennon sisters, little people carrying a grandfather clock for some fucking reason. It's it's weird. It's wild. It's black wild. But the the lie delivery that George C. Scott has is fucking crazy. Because can I do it? Yes, yes, you can, but Thomas just appears <laughs> out of frame and goes, hey, detective, detective, as if they knew each other, and mm-hmm. then runs up to George C. Scott, and then he says- Well, he did He did say earlier that he knew him a little bit. A but little he goes, bit, but, but then he says- I'm so sorry you were murdered, Thomas. I miss you. <laughs> I- I actually kind of like it. <laughs> it's the way he says it. He goes, oh, I'm so sorry you were murdered. Thomas. Like, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, to, to like bring it back up, he goes, I miss you. I miss you. <laughs> and then it is abruptly cut off by a shot of Father Dyer being slammed into the bed at top speed. Right. Well, well, 
there's also again the Patrick Ewing and the Fabio and like those cameos that are there. It's yeah, it's a weird fucking scene. It's so <laughs> wild. And in fact, the the director's cut refers to it again later because uh, when the Gemini talks about and uh, possessing Father Karras's body, he talks about how you know he was caught at the way station. Right. He was like, I was on my way up to you know the other side. And he does, you know how he does like the weird lion roar at one point in the movie? Yeah, the growl. Yeah. He also, Brad Dourif does an impression of a train complete with like kicking his legs like they're <laughs> wheels. Oh my like, God. I need to watch this, this uh, director's cut. It's pretty, it's pretty wacky. What the fuck? But then we get a, 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 the scene that I feel is genuinely pretty great because mm. in that heaven scene, he also runs into Father Dyer. Yes. Yeah. And you notice that Father Dyer also has his neck stitched up mm-hmm. and he says, something like along the lines of uh isn't it odd that we're both having the same dream right now or something like that yeah he says i'm not dreaming right we cut to the hospital again and father dyer has been murdered in his hospital bed Mm -hmm. he had his finger cut off his uh blood drained from his body perfectly without spilling a drop into separate containers Mm -hmm. other than what is written on the wall in father dyer's blood which is it's a wonderful life and that is genuinely fucking cool as shit. It's creepy as hell. Yeah. It's a great reveal. I also love when he gets the... We just see this outside shot of Kinderman's house when the phone rings. Right. And we hear him say, what are you telling me? Right. And then this POV shot of every cop, like, flattening themselves against the wall yeah. and staring him at him as he comes in. Because they know, like, he is, you know, two seconds away from just losing his fucking mind. Right. This is his friend who's dead. And when he lifts up the sheet, he even has, like, a, oh, God. Yeah. Kind of line i did find it disturbing though i was watching this movie with priscilla and she goes there's no way that's five liters of blood in those containers i'm like how do you know exactly how many liters of blood are in a human body <laughs> that's that's upsetting <laughs> i do love that he he looks at that and he's like that's all of it yeah like he can't believe like that's a life like right there yeah a human life can fit in five liters of blood yeah and i gotta say too i i think i'm narrowing in on putting this movie on the schedule for one of these seasons but between this movie and halloween 2 Mm. i do love these old school nurse outfits with the little hats (laughs) i think it's a great look Uh and uh I forget her name. It be, it's Amy Keating or something like that. Mm. She's kind of this other nurse that's in the hospital that's walking around with this red sweater and this little hat on. It's a great look. Oh, yeah. Love her. Mm-hmm. So, Dorothy Scott interviews the nurses in the in the hospital and says, you know, did anybody come in to see Father die or did you see anybody? And one of the nurses who refers to herself later on as a bitch <laughs> says- I love her. She's great. She has no nonsense. For, she's a perfect, like, synergy with Dorothy Scott. This man is hemorrhaging. Mm-hmm. She says uh, there was Miss Clelia, who is this kind of catatonic, really uh, kind of out there patient that is in the uh, elderly section of the hospital, like mm-hmm. uh, older people, kind of like a, nur- a nursing home almost. So, George C. Scott goes to interview her, and I love this lady, because <laughs> she she asks him, are you the radio repairman? And he goes, yes, yes, I am. Mm-hmm. She goes, well, here's the radio right here holding up nothing. And he goes, well, what's wrong with it? And she goes, it's not a radio. <laughs> she goes, I knew you weren't the radio repairman. That's a telephone I'm holding. <laughs> she says most, most people wouldn't know. It's Don't beat so, yourself up. It's so fucking funny. This woman plays it so fucking serious. Right. It's, oh, it's amazing. Yeah, I she's great. I love I love Scott Wilson mm-hmm. uh, as Dr. Temple. This mm-hmm. this son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> smoking cigarette. Like, another movie with someone smoking a cigarette next to an oxygen tank. Uh, we, we gotta talk about uh, Dr. Temple a little later on for sure. Oh, yeah. But then we get the t- another tour of this hospital and we get to go uh, to the disturbed ward. And I'm like, man, I want to hang out in the disturbed ward and just play stupefy on a loop. That'd be fucking cool as hell. <laughs> I fucking don't. Dropping plates on y'all ass. Do you want to give us your disturbed impression for this disturbed ward right here? Hard pass. <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't made it to the fucking soundboard yet. <laughs> I really have been thinking about putting it on, to be honest with you. But he gets to go into this ward, and it's like a, a psych ward, basically. Everybody's in padded cells, all that good stuff. Mm-hmm. And he looks in on one... And he gets pulled away. We don't know why, but we kind of, the camera follows into the the cell. We see someone in silhouette and they just say, I was only 21 when I died. Oh, yeah. And I was like, damn, this movie's tone. It's good shit. It's so close to being perfect. Mm-hmm. It's so close. Yeah. This is the, this is where he flips out on Dr. Friedman. Yeah. And then finally. Will you like, shut your goddamn mouth? <laughs> it's so good. And I wrote, this is where I wrote, like, he's phenomenal here. Like, so he, good. And he 
like very calmly explains the Gemini's MO. Right. And I, oh, I just, I, I, I love, and I also, I'm always a sucker for this trope of like, well, we put false information in the papers. Right. To, to, to weed out the, you know, the fake confessions. Right. But this guy knows how the Gemini actually killed people. Right. So, so if you haven't seen the movie, basically what happens is that by this point, there's been three murders mm-hmm. and Dorsey Scott is like, look, all of these murders have the same MO. They cut off the, I think it's the right index finger Mm -hmm. uh, and in the left palm of the hand is uh, someone has carved the sign of the Gemini, the Zodiac sign. All the victims have uh, a name, either a first minute or a last that starts with the letter K. Mm -hmm. And he says, all of this is the MO of a serial killer that was active 15 years ago called the Gemini Killer, Mm -hmm. who they believe they put in the electric chair and killed and is no longer alive. But one of the doctors at the hospital says, that's crazy. We already killed the guy. And he goes, well, all of the MO information we put out to the press, we said, oh- uh, He carves it in the back. Right. He removes the left finger. Yeah. Right. We put out a fake MO. So that way, when people call into the police station to say, I'm the Gemini Killer, we'd ask, okay, uh, what did you do to the victim? Oh, I carved the Zodiac on their back. I cut off this finger we're like well we know those are just people just wanted to take credit and they're crazy and we'll just dismiss them yeah this person knew exactly everything specific about the gemini killer so whoever is committing these murders must be the gemini killer and we killed the wrong man right and also says that like anytime he wrote they basically took inspiration from the zodiac killer in real life they're like every time he wrote a letter into uh the police taunting about his murders and that they couldn't catch him he would always end the last word of a sentence that ended with an L with two L's, such as wonderful, wonderful. with two L's. When it, it's so specific, and I love the attention to detail about stuff like that. Because yeah, then, I do too. It's a nice little touch. Yeah. Because then when they're like, well, what about what about Father Karras? His name didn't start with a K. <laughs> he goes, Father Karras' middle name was Kevin. <laughs> no, it was uh, Father Dyer. Father yeah, Dyer, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. That I would wanted... be insane if they were like, Father Karras' right. name didn't start with a K. <laughs> right, I'm sorry, Father Dyer. I'm like, I wanted to cut to... Uh, Fuck, I'm terrible with names lately. The, from Home Alone, the mom. You're not doing great. No, I just wanted her to cut to Kevin! Kevin! <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think the lemon drop's getting to me. Carl, that kills people. <laughs> Carl, that kills people! <laughs> <laughs> I miss Lobos with hats. God damn it. And then we are abruptly introduced to Father Morning. Right? Uh, with some fucking haunted house shenanigans of Boy. bleeding crucifix that he doesn't react to. Father Morning is the one that they, they he, when he's interviewing the other priest later on that says, oh, he had an exorcism and overnight his hair turned white. Is that the <laughs> yeah. same? It's the same one, right? Yes, yeah, that's him. Yeah. It's a weird fucking reveal, but... Uh, and, I, and I love this actor. I mean, he's he was Merlin in Excalibur, right? which was like a, a movie that blew my mind as a kid. Same director <laughs> as The Exorcist 2. Weird mm-hmm. connection there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, speaking of connections, this is where we have get kind of a... a bigger connection to the first movie which mm. is why we find out why thomas the 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 black 12 year old boy was killed right so in the first movie there was a recording of reagan made and it sounded like a foreign language and so they sent this tape off to a lab to be analyzed to figure out what language is this possessed version of reagan speaking maybe we can help identify you know figure some stuff out mm-hmm. and then this woman at this lab figured out oh she's not speaking in a demonic language she's speaking english in reverse right and that that woman, her son, was Thomas, the boy killed at the docks with the, the ingots and everything. Right. So, there is a connection greater to the first movie here. And then there's kind of a weird scene where, like, both the new priests that George C. Scott's interviewing and him, like, hear a bunch of noises and stuff, and he goes to investigate. Yeah. And that's in both versions of the movie, and mm-hmm. it's very... It comes it, it comes to nothing. Yeah, it really doesn't mean anything. And then he, Dorsey Scott goes back to the hospital. A lot of this movie is going back to the hospital. Where Dr. Temple is in his spooky, sexy office. So- <laughs> like, you might as well have a title card that says, <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the hospital. It really <laughs> does. Right. Like... I, I do love that, like, at first you're not sure what the what is happening, but, like, he's rever- he, Dr. Temple's rehearsing a speech right. for a conversation he hasn't had yet. Right. He's, like, he's notes. rehearsing what he's going to say to George C. Scott. He's got note cards. Wait, I mean, do you guys not try do you guys not test all your jokes for this show on your significant other <laughs> oh, no. beforehand no 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 i'm reading off a script everything i've said right now is yeah it's written yeah, for we're me all on script yeah oh i'm free balling this <laughs> Tem- temple's got like like occult books and like spooky daggers mm-hmm. and then also just a straight up like 
naked pinup model on the wall. Yep. <laughs> like, yep. It's so weird. So he, he tells George C. Scott, the man you saw in that cell the other day in the disturbed ward, mm-hmm. uh, he went, go, ah, <laughs> and he said, we, we found him roaming this, sh- this, the city streets mm-hmm. and, he was basically catatonic. We found him 15 years ago, mm-hmm. and we put him in this cell. He wasn't very responsive to things. Recently, he kind of came alive, and he was getting better, and I believe that he's the Gemini killer or whatever. Whatever he it is. He claims to be the Gemini killer, yeah. Right, right. Whatever he says. And so, George Scott's like, okay, well, let me, let me go b- back and talk to the nurse, who, again, refers to herself as a bitch. Well, before <laughs> that, what he says, he says he, tell, he, he claims to be the Gemini killer. Right. Smash cut to George C. Scott awkwardly backing out of a room from mm-hmm. a scene, like seeing him, but we don't get to see that. Like they're right. working with like the usable footage. It's very strange. Th- they're holding off on this reveal as long as they can, basically. Yeah. And uh, so he goes to interview the nurse again, and he is like, the night that he came in, did he have lacerations? Did he have any cuts on him or anything? Was he and- dressed like a priest? <laughs> right. And uh, the woman goes, well, that would be in the file. And he goes, not in the file. He is not in the file. It is not. <laughs> and then, then we cut to the reveal here, right. which is a shot of Jason Miller, mm-hmm. Father Karras from the first movie, in the cell, leaning forward out of the shadows and saying, "It's a wonderful life. It's such a great fucking moment, it's man. It's really good. Yeah. I just, I feel like the reveal is kind of hindered by the editing, though. It like, is. It's, it just doesn't hit as hard as it should, but it is such a cool reveal. Like, Instead of a, oh, shit, it's more of a, <laughs> wait, wait, what? It's like a, okay. Well, the, you know how the, the the theatrical cut ends with them burying Father Karras? Like, right. they're at his graveside. Very abrupt it's ending, but yes. It's such an abrupt ending. <laughs> the, in the director's cut, that shot happens here because they're exhuming his body. Right. Bill looks down into the grave and says... It isn't him. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's a different it's a different priest that supposedly died on the same night that they then buried. The the guy that he cause he makes a joke later about how I scared Brother Fane. And they're like, that's the body we found in the right. The like basically when he possessed Father Karras's body, he murdered another priest and threw him into the coffin. Yep. Oh, okay. There's a lot going on, <laughs> which like ties that off really nicely. Which I, I mean, it, it makes sense. But then in the theatrical version, you see Father Karras's grave, and it's like recently been uh, you know dug up, and you're like, right. what, what the fuck? And then they just cut the credits. It's right. like, well, what's the fuck? But no, the, like say what you will about Jason Miller, like this this little moment here in this reveal of, of him saying it's a wonderful life it's fucking it's really good oh yeah oh his he, he, I think he's very good yes. in these bits where he's being very kind of like flirtatious and, mm-hmm. and making fun of him I, I think he's really great and I do think as much as I love Brad Dourif saving the reveal of Brad Dourif for when he just pops off yeah. at Kinderman here is good. Like, yeah. I think that that's, that's a great way to bring him out swinging. Yeah, we get one of many monologues from Brad Dourif here <laughs> and he's basically explaining kind of the plot that we've already discussed, which mm-hmm. is, you know, Father Karras died, I took over his body, the master, as he keeps referring to him, Satan, he's mm-hmm. like, he sent me back and, you know, he was not pleased with what Pazuzu did or how Reagan got exercised and everything. And, and something he's I playing... Re- oh, go, go ahead. I was going to say, something I don't quite get is he keeps insisting, have you told the papers that the Gemini killer is back? Have you, you need to tell them. Mm-hmm. I'm like, for why? Because they want, he wants the, he wants the journalists to show up and see Father Karras as, bo- like, Father Karras is the Gemini killer. Hmm. Like, I truly think that's the plot. T- to what... To what end? Because like, he, what says, is- he says the master wanted to cause a scandal or something okay. like that. Okay. Which is, yeah, it's a weird it's a weird plot for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy into it. But the, the greatest part about this is, like, you haven't seen... It's been Jason Miller up to this point doing this monologue. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you need to tell the papers the Gemini killer is back. And George C. Scott goes, the Gemini is dead. And cut smash cut to no! a screaming Brad Dourif going, no, I am not. Wild. It's a, it's a hell of a fucking reveal. Like, go tell Andy I'm coming for him. <laughs> I do a dumbbell. I. <laughs> That's how I got into Father Karras's body. <laughs> the wizard Gandalf approaches. He is no friend of Rohan. You know, since last season, I have shown my stepdaughter, who's ten years old now. I've shown her Child's Play. Okay, 
she thought it was a laugh riot. It's she a blast. was all up. I forgot in that movie. There's like a gas leak explosion yeah. of a house. No, we we covered it for that's a scary movie. And Ashley's big takeaway was there's way more fucking explosions than I expected there's from a killer doll. So movie. many explosions from a horror movie about a killer doll. It's so many. There's gunfights. <laughs> well. I mean, Michael Bay ghost director. <laughs> it just in the way that the movie ends with just like a charred corpse just leaning up against a wall it's of a doll. It's so fucking fun. <laughs> um, I I think Dorif is amazing here. He's playing with different tones and different cadences, mm-hmm. and like almost like there are different voices coming through him. He's so good. Yeah, he's Shakespearean. Yeah, like it's it's a performance for sure. I love the bit where he starts to giggle about like draining all of the blood, and then mm-hmm. he does that. Total Totally flat voice where he goes, I must admit, it makes me chuckle every time. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, oh, it's so scary. <laughs> See, I thought, Nathan, you were going to have a big problem with him going, good night, air. I'm like, oh, Brad Dourif must have seen life. Life, I wrote that down. <laughs> Walk hard. Walk hard. And then George C. Scott punches him out, breaks his nose, <laughs> yeah. and then, like, exits the cell, speaks with his other detective, and he goes, I believe that man in there is the Gemini killer. And my favorite part is, you hear the nurse going in there and going, his goddamn nose is broken! <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. Oh, it's great. And then, we get what I think you were talking about. The greatest jump scare of all time. It's, it's, man... On, on this first watch, the first time I watched this movie, I knew it was coming because oh, I'd man. seen that clip before, but it still got me. On this second watch, I feel like the scene is just a little too long. Sure. Knowing that it's coming. That's fair. We don't need we don't need her going like from room to room. Yeah. I think if it was just the unbroken shot, but it is like from 11206 to 11629 mm-hmm. it's mostly that <laughs> that hallway shot and i i think it's kind of uh, it's kind of incredible it's good i i like the idea of her going into that room with the doctor sleeping just to break it up so you don't like you i feel like when it starts as a wide shot you're kind of expecting it but when sure. you we break it up a little bit. That makes sense. It, it is good, but it, it it just takes too long. And overall, I think it. But man, so this is the nurse we were talking about earlier, Amy uh, Keating. I think is her name. Mm-hmm. The woman in the red the red robe. She's walking through the hospital. She keeps hearing noises, and as she's uh, going back to her desk, the greatest jump scare with like a snap zoom and everything. It's so goddamn funny. It's funny, <laughs> but it's also. <laughs> scary as hell because i saw this movie for the first time when i was 14 and oh my fully, god i jumped out of my skin i thought oh it was my excellent. god dude i was watching this with my wife and no she way. wasn't really paying attention mm-hmm. until that moment and she was like the fuck are you watching <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to mention earlier that george C. scott went and spoke to like a coroner or a forensic detective or something and he talked about these gardening shears mm-hmm. i'm assuming they're gardening shears <laughs> talked about these gardening shears that are spring activated and i guess was uh used as a crime scene and in this moment during the jump scare they're so big they're, they're huge. enormous during this jump scare, it's a snap zoom in to someone covered in a white sheet mm-hmm. falling behind this nurse with gardening shears as if they're about to cut their head off. And yeah. it's, it is truly like probably the most memorable scene of this movie. It yeah. is insane. Like it's so funny, but also I think it's funny because it's so terrifying. Yes. There's a lot of decapitations in this movie. <laughs> they recreate this scene. This movie doesn't fuck with heads. No, it doesn't. doesn't. <laughs> they recreate this scene in the finale of the Exorcist TV series oh, to okay. really great effect. Wait, what? Yeah. See, I've heard good things about that. Have either of you seen it? I no. loved it when it was on the air. Yeah, I've heard it's good, which I'm surprised because it's a Fox TV show, right? Yeah. I'm genuinely surprised. It's good? I liked it a lot. I've heard it's good. I, I And, and I, I think season two was actually better than the first one because they get away more from like the exorcist lore. There were multiple seasons? Yeah, there was like what, yeah. two or three? John Cho is like the lead actor in season two. Yeah. I'm learning all kinds of shit right now. Yeah, it, I mean, it ends on a cliffhanger, but I, I, w- I was into it. Yeah. So they say the next day where she's got comes back to the hospital, they say this woman, the, the nurse, was slit down the middle, mm-hmm. cut open, all her vital organs removed, and and the killer stuffed her bodies with rosaries. Mm-hmm. But the detective refers to them as other materials, which I <laughs> thought was... <laughs> and then, Oh, and then she was sewed back up. 
And I'm like, Jesus Christ. Oh, <laughs> like, it's it's a lot. There's a lot of like, oh, and then this happened and then this happened to this person's body. And then this happened. Doesn't the Gemini say something along the lines of like, I gave Amy her beads or something like that? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe it does. Yeah. And then, yeah, this is actually where we get the reveal of like the full, like, how is the Gemini killer doing all of this and stuff like that? Uh-huh. Turns out that he's able to possess people out like he's able to leave his body and possess other people the catatonic people Mm -hmm. and that's where we cut to lady uh the the old lady calalia that i guess apparently must have murdered uh uh father dyer Mm. and maybe one of the unintentionally hilarious things (laughs) of this movie (laughs) the old lady crawling on the seal it's a creepy moment but the fact that she's over cranked yes and everyone else is moving at normal speed it does look goofy as shit but the idea is creepy. It's there. Mm-hmm. Like, again, this movie is so close to being perfect. Like, the tone is there, but not all of the execution is 100%. I, I feel that way about this following uh, battle in the kitchen yes. where the idea is good, yeah. but seeing George C. Scott getting choked out by an old lady. Well, there's a couple <laughs> of things about that scene that don't work, but we should also mention Dr. Temple killed himself, oh, right. and we find out that apparently he had been helping being the Gemini killer, Mm -hmm. you know, be able to to get people there and everything like that. So that's why he kills himself. And so, yeah, uh, he tries to rush home because he makes a connection that the, the Gemini killer intends to kill his daughter. And I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the taxi uh-huh. that the old lady nurse is in has an antenna that is at least like a full two-story building high. It is <laughs> no, I that. ridiculously high. It is a tall boy. It's such a tall antenna. I like this bit, though, where he's trying to call home and he's getting a busy signal, yes. but his wife answers the phone. And just judging from her dialogue, she hears Bill saying, I'm sending a nurse over, which yes. I, I like that. So Pazuzu's talking to her with George C. C- Scott's voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then he, like, he busts in the door. You would think the old lady nurse has already done the business and killed his daughter, but right. she's sitting at a table and she goes, something like, I've been waiting a long time for this, pulls out these gigantic fucking shears. From her Mary Poppins purse. Uh-huh. <laughs> And the effect of the grandma pulling Julie, his daughter, away from the gardening shears is... It looks it, weird. Not great. No. I, is it a composite shot? How? What is it that... Something about that looks so strange. strange. Is that what it is? Okay. I think they filmed it at 24 frames and they just sped it up. Okay. So, it looks goofy as hell. It but it is. Yeah. It's not great. And right as the old lady, again, possessed by Bazuzu, is about to choke out George C. Scott and kill him... She falls back on her back and then just shouts, Father Morning. Uh-huh. Cut to Father Morning entering the disturbed ward. Yeah, I guess just <laughs> letting himself in, huh? Because they explain in detail how very sophisticated this entryway into this disturbed ward is. Well, first you got to put in a combination. The code changes every it day. It changes every day. Someone else has to visually approve you going in there. And yeah, he's just in there. Send up a smoke signal. <laughs> throw, a carrier, throw a carrier pigeon. <laughs> you know, you throw those. But... He enters the cell Mm -hmm. with uh, Jason Miller slash Brad Dourif (laughs) slash Pazuzu. And begins to perform an exorcism. And man, there's there's a lot happening here. So there's like fire that- <laughs> Fire and snakes. The snake puppets that are in the foreground of the shot- It's so funny. It's so fucking funny. <laughs> it's like, it turns into a Jim Henson pr- production real quick. Not like, only that, but uh, Nicole Williamson's performance, he suddenly becomes like Emperor Palpatine. When he goes, <laughs> you robber of life. <laughs> but it's like- like I almost expect, you know, like at the beginning of Labyrinth, when it's all the pu- the puppets just like, oh no, she's got to say I wish or whatever. <laughs> right. uh, I expected that with the snakes. Like, <laughs> no, he's got a wish for the exorcism. That's not the part, is it? <laughs> yeah, but also like this this demon starts just blowing his clothes Dude, off. The Bible explodes. <laughs> it's, so, it's so fucking funny. <laughs> this whole sequence has no reason to be in this movie. It's simultaneously funny, but then it is also genuinely creepy as, and disturbing because Father Morning gets pinned to the wall mm. and has to peel himself off, and yeah. the, the skin being peeled off his face and everything. It's a real. It's a pretty good effect. It's not bad. It not at all. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, for what it is, like this yeah. movie didn't need an exorcism, but I get it. Mm-hmm. You call it the exorcist, you gotta. Yeah, but I love seeing a priest murdered. <laughs> 
Don't we all? Don't we all gather around the fire annually and uh, watch a fire priest get murdered? Wait, wait, what do you guys do on Christmas morning? <laughs> <laughs> so, so George C. Scott runs back to the hospital yet again and enters the cell. Father Morning is passed out. You think he's dead. Mm-hmm. And Pazuzu pins George C. Scott to the wall. And he goes, do you believe now, Father? Or whatever he says, do you believe now? And he says, yes, I believe. I believe in death. I believe in disease. I believe in injustice and inhumanity and torture and anger and hate the way the way george c scott says and infidelity infidelity and he goes i believe in slime and stink and every crawling putrid thing every possible ugliness and corruption you son of a bitch yeah everyone heard me crush the monologue earlier it's fine (laughs) crushed it crushed this is this is my uh demo reel i hope you don't mind i'm piggybacking but that opens up like a, like a lightning burst in this in this padded cell oh and opens gosh. up a hole in the ground and I guess these just deceased victims of uh, the Gemini killer or somebody or whatever mm-hmm. rise up from this hole in the ground. It's kind of uh, like uh, the ending of uh, Drag Me to Hell. Drag Me to Hell with like the, the <laughs> hell in reverse. <laughs> yes, like but it much slower and much more pedantic. Mm-hmm. Like honestly. And then it's Jason Miller pinned to a cross, or the rowing oars, actually. We briefly get to see Thomas's body as well. You get to see the black face Jesus statue, you sure do. Yeah. But he, he rises from the ground, and there's, like, again, there's snakes, there's fire and everything. Did you want, did anyone else notice that possessed Jason Miller kind of just looked like Bill Murray? In, like, uh, in, in like, uh, looked, Zombieland? In Zombieland. Perfect. That's a perfect description. <laughs> yeah, he think, really did. Yeah, I can see it for sure. But I, I just feel like they could have done a little bit more to show these uh, deceased people. Like, they're just, like, painted white. Yeah. I don't know. I thought I thought the production value wasn't really there for the scene. It's like that episode of Community where uh, Jill McHale gets hit with monkey gas, so his face <laughs> and his hair turns white. <laughs> mm-hmm. He, uh, Father Morning, uh, is still alive, mm-hmm. and uh, shouts at uh, Brad Dourif slash Jason Miller. You got to fight it. You got to fight it. And then Father Karras briefly regains control of his really deceased body. He's kind mm-hmm. of a zombie at this moment. And he just the ending of this movie is wild. He just <laughs> shouts at George C. Scott, Bill, now, kill me now, shoot me. And fucking George C. Scott's like, you got it, buddy. And then blammo. <laughs> no problem. Just shoots him. Just shoots him like six times in the chest and kills him. Mm-hmm. And then not for nothing, gets up and double taps him right in the head. Yeah. He says, Bill, we won. Always go for the double tap. <laughs> Always. Hey, speaking of zombie land, there you go. Always go for the double tap. So basically, George C. Scott put an end to Pazuzu possessing Father Karras' uh, body. Mm-hmm. And so he, he, he shot him dead for good this time. And man, they wrap up this movie so quickly because <laughs> real fucking quick. We cut to like a shot of the sun, a shot of some grieving priest, a shot of a gravestone with uh, Father uh, Karras's, uh you know inf- information on it, the epitaph, and then we're just out of there. We're gonna get the fuck out, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> get to the credits right right away. Can I tell you how the director's cut ends? Please, please, I'm dying to know. It's even more abrupt. So he, that's not possible. How? How? It is. Bill Bill goes to his house, saves his daughter. Then since Father Morning's not in the movie the next shot is him going back to the hospital of course he's in the disturbed ward and he tells the nurse <laughs> he's she's like yeah i can let you in i was about to check on him and he goes like oh i won't be long and he goes in looks at the gemini the gemini says uh we'll we'll get her don't worry and bill looks at him for like two seconds and says pray for me damien you're free and then just shoots him dead <laughs> Cut to credits. <laughs> I, Rock and roll, honestly. Just fucking executes him. It rules. Uh, I kind of like, I like both. <laughs> I like both options. I, the only reason I don't like this theatrical thing that much is because it's so fucking quick. Mm-hmm. Give me Jorcey Scott, you know, giving me a eulogy or something, you know? The novel ends even more quietly because he, the reason that the Gemini killed in the first place was to shame his father. They find out that his dad died of a heart attack. And so the Gemini just wills himself to die what? wow like after a lengthy co- yeah it's like a it's a very quiet ending all right well no matter which way you slice it but i i kind of yeah i like the simplicity of kenderman just walking in and being like yeah i'm about to go to prison for murdering yeah. a patient at a hospital yeah and then he does it I, I i dig both endings like even like satan like you can't <laughs> i mean i'm sorry you can't fight 
a, a nine millimeter, you know? <laughs> I do. I was about to say, I do like that the solution to a possessed person is just shoot them. Just they, <laughs> like, they clearly aren't doing active shooter drills in hell. <laughs> Guys, the Pope's Exorcist is not good, but. Oh boy. The opening of the movie. <laughs> they do an act. Is them doing an active shooter drill? Do they beat no. face off? <laughs> the opening of the movie, he brings a pig in, negs a demon until it jumps into the pig's body, and then he shoots the pig in the head. <laughs> oh, so it's like the successful version of the exorcism scene in uh, Drag Me to Hell. Where Basically. They try to do that with the goat. Where I'm just like, for the first five minutes of that movie, I was like, this is gonna rule. <laughs> <laughs> I have one final question, mm. and it's my final note of the movie. Is uh, so what's up with that carp? Yeah, y'all gonna eat? <laughs> Has he? Did, does he genuinely not shower the entire movie? Because it's days, days go by in this movie. <laughs> and we see him sweat. We see oh, him bleed. Boy, that's why he yells. I believe in stink. I believe in stink because I fucking smell it on me. That's right. He's a stanky boy. He is a stanky boy. <laughs> Well, is there anything else we want to talk about before we get to the wrap-up segments here for Exorcist 3, colon, Legion, colon, movie film for theaters? <laughs> <laughs> you know, as much as I love Brad Dorif in this movie, I think he gives the better performance in the theatrical cut. Yeah. He's way more reserved in uh, in the director's cut. And Interesting. And because those scenes are so long, you lose a lot of, like, the dynamics of that performance. Yeah, no, Brad Dorif is, like, again, he is just Shakespearean in his performance. He's he unbelievable. playing to a crowd even though that crowd is just George C. Scott like it's <laughs> and Jason Miller again not for nothing for mm-hmm. the little bit of ease in this movie he is crushing it as a possessed version of himself yeah, yeah he's not bad at all no there's really not bad performance in this movie like no. I said I think my problems fall with the way it's shot, some of the editing, mm-hmm. and the pacing. I feel like other than that... I will say, George C. Scott does this whole movie remind me of the library cop from Seinfeld. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. Absolutely. All right. Well, let us get to Prop Cop. For new listeners of the show, Prop Cop is a segment that we do here at the end of the show where we talk about uh, all the different props that are in the movie... The Exorcist 3, and we pick one for ourselves, for our personal collection. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and go. I'm going to pick the obvious one, I think, at least to me. I want the little stuffed penguin that he brings Father Dyer when he's in the hospital. Nice. I think that's great. Mally, what's your prop? Those big-ass scissors. The gardening shears, of course. The spring-activated shears, as we're told multiple times. Hell yeah. Ooh, that basil plant in my kitchen ain't fucking ready. It it really (laughs) is like a prop. Like, if they wanted to shoot something close up, they blew it up. (laughs) Those do not exist in real life. No. (laughs) Not at all. Those are are made for the movie. It's like like the pair of, of glasses used in... And strangers on a train and Hitchcock's on a train where they're like they made like them four times the size of actual glasses just to get them uh-huh. big in the frame like that's what these gardening shears are uh, Nathan what's your prop I, I I really loved there's an old camera prop in the theater lobby mm-hmm. that they walk by at one point mm-hmm. uh, and I, I'd like that I think they'd be nice in my office uh, another option that we didn't talk about mm. but Dorsey Scott goes to bed mm-hmm. with the sounds of a music box snow globe he sure terrified does creepy and a bottle of sleeping pills mm-hmm. right next to that so that was gonna be my other choice was i want them sleeping pills jesus <laughs> who knows maybe it's ambient just like charlie took in the whale and he's, he's getting a real good night's sleep but he may he may wake up and say some racist stuff who knows Ambien like does weird things apparently who's to say do you get racist when you take ambient no i've taken ambient and fallen right to sleep i don't know what roseanne was fucking talking about <laughs> <laughs> all right let's talk about bit part which is where we look at all of the extras in the movie preferably non-named characters and we pick one of them for ourselves mm-hmm. to, as a starring role. Um, I'll go ahead and give you mine. I want to be the nurse. It's such a random little like throwaway nothing moment, but she randomly just shouts, who stuck this guy? <laughs> I think it's when Georgie Scott and Father Dyer are having a conversation and it just cuts to her for no reason and it cuts back and they don't even comment on it. They're just like, oh, it's so peaceful here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Nathan, what about you? What's your what's your bit part? Um, in the heaven sequence, there is a guy who's oh, I know what dr- you're gonna say. dressed like Snoopy as the Red Baron, <laughs> 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 just kind of staring yeah. into the middle distance. And yeah. I like, I thought for half a second it was uh, James Hurley from Twin Peaks. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's who I'd be. Yeah, Mally? Uh, I want to be the lady on the ceiling. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Lady Clelian, yeah. <laughs> I had two backups that I think are worth at least mentioning here. Mm-hmm. The other is here in that heaven scene. There's a guy dressed up like a priest who's just standing in like a glass dome. Oh, yeah. And doing nothing. Weird shot. I thought that'd be great. Yeah. And then 
God, I really should have picked this one. But there is a when they showed the the old people part of the psych ward for the first time. Mm-hmm. There is a patient in a wheelchair that just rolls up to one of the nurses and flashes her, <laughs> and she just kind of like puts her head on her head, like God damn it, not again, again with this shit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, without further ado, we're going to give you, listener, the silver lining to The Exorcist Trace. Who would like to go first? Uh, I'll go with an obvious one. Mm -hmm. Father Karras is free of the Gemini and can finally rest. Yeah, absolutely. Even though that means getting shot in the heart a couple (laughs) times. And then in the head. (laughs) Being unrecognizable at his funeral. (laughs) Well, according to this movie, we know what he's going to look like in heaven. He's just going to be riddled with bullet holes. (laughs) Right. Uh, Mally, what's your silver lining? Uh, A priest dies. You know what? I actually wrote down Father Morning successfully performed an exorcism, even if he lost his face. <laughs> yeah, no, not not that first bit, but the second part. Yeah, no, totally. Oh, oh, got you. The one in the in the confessional booth. Got it. No, no, I was saying that I don't give a shit that he performed an exorcism. I'm oh, just glad a priest died. Fair enough. Okay, we got some problems with the Catholic Church. No, no arguments for me here. Coming for him. <laughs> We're finally going to bring down the Catholic Church. <laughs> this is the season we finally do it. <laughs> We've been putting it off for too long. Uh, but yeah, my, my silver lining is that Julie's okay. Yeah. I mean, she narrowly escaped getting her head fucking cut off. If it wasn't for her glitching grandmother. <laughs> for her racist glitching s- sped up camera get grandma. <laughs> I mean, say what you will. Racism makes you faster. <laughs> is that a fact? Have we tested that? This movie proved it. <laughs> That's one of the wildest things I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 158 episodes in, we could still churn out wisdom, apparently. <laughs> well, if you're uh, you know familiar with our show, you know that at the end of every episode, we always like to pair the movie of the week with a double feature, a pick-me-up alternative, a movie that you watch after The Exorcist 3 mm-hmm. to balance things out. Nathan, what is your pick-me-up movie alternative? I had to go with another off-kilter police procedural starring Brad Dourif. Mm-hmm. Of course, I'm talking about Werner Herzog's Bad Lieutenant Port of Call, New Orleans. Damn! <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right. Okay. Mally, what you got for me? Uh, I'm going for another film where the Catholic Church gets what's fucking coming to him. Uh, <laughs> Spotlight. I was going to say Spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's the thing. I I wrote down to one that is not actually a real true all like pick me up alternative, mm. but that is a movie that I feel like is similar that is also really good. Mm. Interesting. And I think people, more people should see it. Um, I think you should watch Talk to Me, which also deals with possessed bodies doing things. Is is that the movie where Bruce Willis is a baby? No, you're thinking <laughs> of Look Who's Talking to Me. Got this it. is th- this is now the highest grossing. <laughs> <laughs> this is now the highest grossing A24 horror film of 2023 called Talk to Me. Really got Nathan with that one. You really uh, got him. You really got him. Kirstie Alley gets possessed by a baby. <laughs> But it is, I'll go ahead and tell you, it is a future episode on this show, without question. But it has very similar themes, and it's uh, it's it's a really good movie. And my actual uh, pick-me-up alternative, as it, you know, as much as I enjoyed the exorcisms from the first movie, the original, I, I mean, it, it doesn't get any better than watching Jade's Woods and fucking uh, Natasha Leon mm-hmm. in Scary Movie 2 oh, doing the same yes. thing. So, nice. great call. Yeah. Can I throw out one more uh Double feature with this. Absolutely. We're recording this on the 30th anniversary of the premiere of The X Files. Mm -hmm. And there is a two year anniversary of Malignant. Let's not forget. Let's put some respect (laughs) on their name. Mm -hmm. Um, But the. uh, Ah, the Fuck a chair. (laughs) (laughs) The first season of The X Files has a great episode called Beyond the Sea Mm. that stars Brad Dourif playing a a real Gemini killer type. Mm -hmm. A very similar performance, but uh, it's no less fantastic. I would say, check that one out as well yeah. say what you will about rob zombies halloween movies but god damn it brad dorf brings it in those sure. he's the best part of those movies like hands down yeah brad dorf that guy could probably play a serial killer sometime <laughs> who knew i don't know it seems like he'd be perfect for that guy. i think he'd be really good at it andy <laughs> really good at it hey father care he's <laughs> looking for andy <laughs> What's the line he has in the second movie? He's like, I got a date with a six-year-old boy. Yes, he sure does. <laughs> I'm, sh- I'm sure someone's done it, but people have replaced all of Woody's dialogue and Toy Story with Brad Dorf, right? <laughs> Definitely. You've got a friend in me. Andy. Uh, we're friends till the end, Buzz. <laughs> 
Uh, do we recommend The Exorcist Three? Oh hell yeah! Yeah, yeah. it's a it's a trippy watch. Uh, if you if you've stayed away from the movies just because you've heard that The Exorcist sequels are bad, uh, that's mostly correct. Yeah, but <laughs> check this one out for sure. I mean, it's gonna be better than the new one that's coming out. God, like, wait, yeah, yeah, probably. What that looks like a real stinker. And it's definitely it's definitely better than I was gonna say both prequels, but it's really just two versions of one movie. Yeah, I I'm so curious. I still think I gotta see. That was such a weird call. Yeah. yeah. The first one did so badly that we're going to let Paul Schrader finish shooting his. Yeah. The original Snyder cut. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I still think I got I got to see that Dominion just to close the chapter on the the Exorcist, but it's odd. so far 2 out of 3 ain't bad. So I got to watch this fucking TV show. Yeah, apparently the TV show is fucking great. So um for this movie though, I do think it, the theatrical version at least is the only one I've seen. I think it has its problems, but mm-hmm. I think overall like it's still leaps quality from the second movie and even though it's it's obviously inferior to the first one i still think it's a good movie Mm -hmm. i just i again it's so close to being just right hitting the nail on the head of like what i want from this movie it's just little decisions that didn't quite add up to me which makes the the clunky bits that more infuriating because you're like this is so close to being like a masterpiece right. like it, it could be something really really incredible and instead it's it's an interesting curiosity right another draft of the screenplay and mm-hmm. some some decision some studio notes maybe i don't know because they're the ones that force the exorcism right. scene in the, in the climax i don't and i don't even mind the exorcism scene i just if you're going to do that put father morning in there earlier make it more pivotal to the plot right or you know i, I don't know i there, there's so much here that is good that i i still think it's worth watching if you've never seen it so yeah definitely uh, if you haven't already, listener, we ask that you please subscribe to our show wherever you get it right now uh, and leave us a rating in that platform as well. You can leave us some feedback in that app as well if, while you're there. Uh, if you haven't already followed us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, where you can watch clips from the show. And you can also check out our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Severlinings playlist. And finally, you can also send us a suggestion for the show or tell us how we're doing by emailing us at the Silverlinings playlist at gmail.com. Now, clue for next week. We're keeping the spooky linings playlist train rolling. This is my favorite time of year, and I'm excited because, Mally, next week is your choice. So why don't you tell us a clue for what we're talking about next week? I just never realized until just this moment how easy it is to cut someone in half with a machete. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. We're ready to get back. We're doing it again. Or are we? Hmm, That's a good question. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Fellas, is there anything else we want to say before we put The Exorcist 3 to rest for good? Boys... It's a wonderful life. It is a wonderful life. And I will say, rest in peace, Oatmeal. And I guess rest in peace, Father Karras. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, I think the dead should shut up unless they have something to say. <laughs> Hail Satan. Excelsior. 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 Oh. Look it up. Hello YouTube! If you've made it this far, thanks! Could you do us one more favor? Could you hit those like and subscribe buttons? Maybe leave us a comment on what you think of the show? We'd really appreciate it. Join us again next week for an all new episode. Bye!